modern sociologists have made some analysis of the function of secret societies in the development of man's modern culture. And while these findings are for the most part based entirely upon cultural factors, they give us some rather interesting information which we can enrich and enlarge through reference to a larger frame of research. First of all, a secret society is usually a group of persons divided from their contemporaries by certain obligations, private assembly, and addiction to a particular or special code of conduct. Such societies began, of course, in the primitive world. Early in the history of man's social experience, tribes, barbaric, primitive, savage, developed secret societies. These were particularly concerned with the over-concept of that time, namely the importance of certain rituals and ceremonies in connection with the building of the individual into his tribal life. All of the important periods of life were marked with ritual, ceremony, and symbol. And the most important of ancient ceremonies of this nature had to do with the concept of citizenship as it was then understood. By certain trials, obligations, and revelations, the person was prepared to become part of his social order. In tribal times, he received the wisdom of his tribe, and he proved that he was worthy of that wisdom by undergoing certain trials, real or psychological dangers, indicating his heroism, his patience, his willingness to self-sacrifice, his dedication to the same principles uh, which governed his tribal life. After his initiation into the secret societies, he became a full-fledged member of his community. We may therefore say that in this respect, the secret society was also the school, uh, the university, if we may say, such a primitive society. Here, the accumulated wisdom of the people was made available to each new generation through ritual and ceremony. At the same time, the secret society bound the person to his spiritual conviction. Through this association, he came to know the deities believed to govern his tribe. He was religiously obligated to the ideals and principles of the tribal faith. All of his political and social instruction suspended from his religious conviction. It was therefore incredible that anyone could pass through these tribal mysteries without becoming strongly convinced of the importance of the religion of his people. In addition to these important factors, the tribe and the tribal mysteries had to do with the genetic problems recognized at that time. Among our southwestern Indians, for example, each Pueblo 
has two sides. And the members of these sides have certain religious obligations and certain tribal rites and ceremonies. Marriage must always be across the Pueblo. In other words, marriage must always be into the opposite social group. This was important, as experience had taught that too close intermarriage might prove detrimental to the tribal life. Laws governing conduct were also measured across the Pueblo. But in all important matters, the two sides met for conference, consultation, and co contemplation of the vital needs of the whole people. Gradually, the secret societies became the virtual custodians of authority, causing the modern sociologists to advance the concept that they were highly autocratic groups. If this may be considered legitimate, it may be pointed out that all life at all times has been a curious blending of autocratic leadership and a democratic state. Any individual who assumes leadership, even with the consent of the government, gains certain autocratic powers and prerogatives. It was the work of the old secret societies to so enrich the cultural, moral, and spiritual life of the leader, that he might not be inclined to pervert his authority or to use his powers to exploit or enslave his peoples. Thus the secret society educated the leader, not merely in the arts and sciences, as we generally consider them, but in the moral values and in the ethical overtones essential to proper government or any executive or responsible position. In the classical world, the secret society took a new form. It became more exclusively the custodian of learning. And we may say that through the classical world, particularly Greece, Egypt, and the Roman Empire, most secret societies were not basically political in their implications. It is true that no individual can refrain from some involvement in politics, especially if he is an informed and conscientious person. It cannot be said that Plato was a politician, nor can it be said that the Platonic dialogues are completely non-political. To the philosopher, politics represents enlightened leadership, and he contributes in every way that he can toward this end. And in periods of despotism or tyranny, his weight is naturally against vested authority which has perverted its privileges. For this reason, many prominent leaders in the religious, philosophical, and cultural life of mankind have been persecuted and even martyred because they have interfered with entrenched political beliefs. During the classical period also, we see the secret society moving behind nearly all forms of generalized education. In Rome, Greece, and Egypt, young people were tutored by professional teachers. After they had received what we might term a broad education, considering the opportunities and knowledge of their day, they were then, for the most part, presented for initiation into one of the secret societies. It being understood that it was the duty of such societies to integrate the person, to give him the associations 
the dedication, the consecration, by means of which his knowledge in any field might be clarified, deepened, and the danger of selfishness or perversion mitigated so far as was possible. This is the general story. And of course, even in the classical period, the overtones remained essentially religious. The secret societies were sanctuaries. Those who entered them were instructed in the true meaning of their faith, were given certain keys or interior knowledge. And as in Oriental religious societies, they were given certain scientific methods for the advancement of their personal lives, particularly their internal development of resources. The secret society was psychologically symbolic of the internal life of every person. While we live in this world and to a measure of this world, nearly every person has a more or less secret world of his own. This secret world may be no more than a series of convictions differing from or in advance of popular convictions. The individual who is thoughtful <clears throat> envisions a better world than the one in which he lives. He sees the possibility of man gaining a richer life, developing greater internal securities, and looking around him, he discovers that it is difficult for him to impress these broad convictions upon society. Society is highly dominated by conditioned reflexes and is the individual attempting to live above or beyond his clan or class. Tries to spread his convictions, he meets mostly with opposition. He finds, therefore, that it is inconvenient and injudicious merely to approach strangers with his thoughts. His natural instinct is to seek out others of his own kind, binding himself with them, and finding in their association the opportunity for greater self-expression. Thus clubs, groups arise today around certain principles which they feel need or require organized minorities to advance these principles through common effort. If these principles were identical with the common practices, there would be no need for secret assembly. But if these principles are not identical, even though they may be entirely friendly, kindly, non-political, if they are not totally identical with the public mind, then those so interested and so dedicated inevitably form private groups. These private groups advance charities, practice various benevolence, benevolences, do all that they can to increase the cultural advantage of their members and often of non-members. These kinds of assemblies also were known in antiquity. But in those times, men seldom gathered for trivial purposes. They seldom gathered to meet the simple requirements of the day, inasmuch as society itself, being essentially more simple and having certain natural attitudes, it was not necessary to form special societies to advance the commonplace needs of the people. These, these societies then went after objectives that were not commonplace. We have another group important to consider in the light of the prevailing way of life of ancient man. During the so-called golden age of Pericles, 
and the great Greco-Latin culture. Now, most countries have their own religions, their own temples, their own sanctuaries, and these religions were state faiths. They were financed by the state and were made available to the people. The citizen of a country in good standing therefore worshipped the gods of his country, defended them, and sought from them such help as he might need. In those days, the general attitude of mankind on religious matters was to effect that the religion and the state were identical. Any attack against the state was an attack against religion. Any opposition or attack upon religion was an attack upon total society. Therefore, what we commonly call today uh, intersectarian squabbles could not exist. The individual was born and raised within a national or community religion. Because of this factor, he expected other states or communities to have their own faith. If he journeyed into another area, he generally remain courteous to the deities of that region and seldom attempted or even contemplated any missionary or evangelical uh, attitude or procedure. It did not occur to him that it was right or proper for him to attempt to change the basic faith of the nations in which he visited or traveled, nor would he tolerate others coming into his areas and attempting such procedures. It would seem, therefore, that these areas would remain very much isolated and that religious unity would be next to impossible. The appearance, however, has deceived many persons, including scholars. The facts were somewhat different. Behind the state religions of these different areas were always the secret societies. These were composed mostly of scholars, philosophers, sages, travelers, educators, persons whose knowledge of their own religion and the religions of other peoples exceeded that of the average citizen. Therefore, these various faiths, apparently isolated, were bound together by a network of mysteries or schools of common initiation and a traveler on the level of the secret society journeying from Greece to Egypt found that he was not traveling from one religion to another, but from one interpretation to another. He was therefore constantly reminded that in the core of things, the gods of all these groups were identical deities, known under different names, worshipped with somewhat differing ceremonials, but dedicated to the same principles, and the sciences taught in these different groups were identical, and the arts and the general knowledge were, share, were shared by all, regardless. Therefore, Pythagoras, 600 years before the Christian era, traveling throughout the world, visited and was received hospitably and lovingly by over 20 religions, each of which accepted him without question and accepted his knowledge without question. Consequently, the general archetype behind this situation was that the local deities were bound together by a larger interpretation and that those who entered the secret societies became interreligious in their thinking. For this reason, actual war against any person or group because of religion primarily was exceedingly rare, almost unknown. You did not declare war on a man's faith. You might oppose his political structure, which incidentally, of course, included his faith. You might desire his territories. 
you might seek to gain his wealth, but you did not openly declare war against his God. This was uh, a situation which in many respects uh, resulted in more favorable situations after a period of hostility. When peace was restored, the God concept set in again, and uh, the divisions that might have been otherwise irreconcilable were often mended in this way. Secret societies, therefore, served a great number of purposes and were more widely and generally used than we recognize. In Greece, every free person, man and woman, was entitled to initiation. Consequently, it was not uncommon at the rites of Elysus in Attica for 25,000 persons to be initiated at one ceremonial. It was therefore not merely a small group, but the whole of the cultural pattern was invested in these principles. Naturally, there were smaller schools of specialized instruction, and by degrees, these schools became trade schools and union schools, protecting arts and crafts, demanding apprenticeships, and our entire concept of the apprenticeship system as a means of advancing skill in an art or science or craft. This arose in the secret societies, where the most common things were so organized. In early England, the tailors had their own secret society. So did the plumbers. Secret societies were not left entirely to abstract speculation. Men had a certain pride in their own achievements and a certain sense of responsibility for the quality of their work. In those days, this responsibility was invested in guilds, and guilds were an outcome of classical secret societies. It was the guild that instructed the apprentice, gave him the choicest secrets of his profession or trade, and bound him with obligations to use this knowledge constructively and honorably. It was therefore a most signal offense against society and God to shoddy the workmanship, to use inferior materials, or in any way to misrepresent a contract. The uh, God concept still uh, occupied the mind of the guild masters. Each meeting of the tailors and the plumbers and the shoemakers and the tinsmiths. Each meeting was opened with religious ceremony. Each meeting was closed with prayer. And during the period of these meetings, when matters of common concern, of charity, of taking care of needy or impoverished brethren, whenever these matters were examined, it was in a sanctified atmosphere of dedication and into each of these guilds, deity represented the peculiar guild master. In other words, of all the shoemakers, God was the great shoemaker. Of all the tinsmiths, God was the great tinsmith. Of all the architects, he was the sovereign architect of the world. To all the physicians, he was the master of healing. Each in his own way, therefore, developed a guild faith, a faith based upon performing his normal human activities, his trade, his profession, as a sacred service, as a dedicated recognition of his responsibility to society. And whatever he did that was useful and helpful to others, was a form of religious sacrament. The development, therefore, of great projects with comparative smoothness or procedure marked that time in a day when great mausoleums, temples, palaces, and tombs 
required from 50 years to 500 years for their completion. The work proceeded in an orderly manner. It was hardly necessary to inspect the work. The masters of the guilds inspected the work themselves and were more critical than any outsider could possibly have been. Also, they regulated the wages of the workmen. They held the various religious meetings that were necessary. And from this, we observe inevitably the rise of a religious spirit, a spirit not directly consistent with the general prevailing orthodoxies of those days, a religion which moved directly into action, a religion which was not drowned in theory, but was constantly vitalized by practice. Thus religion itself passed through certain modifications. The guild masters did not leave their faith. Very often they met in the chapels, temples, cathedrals, and churches of their religion. But at the same time, they brought to their religion something previously not so well emphasized, and that was the importance of applying your faith and its principles to the works of your hands, so that each task that was performed was sanctified by the integrity with which it was performed. This type of condition has also drifted down to us in the form of trade unions, in the form of various labor organizations. But little by little, the religious factor has diminished, and these organizations have become protective, uh, essentially, rather than almost completely idealistic. In the religious pattern also, we gradually discover uh, that the decline of the so-called Greco-Latin culture brought with it a gradual motion toward the unification of religion. And of secret societies, we should point out those in which religious rites in areas apart from the natural home of a faith came to be emphasized. The secret societies of early Christendom are at point, and are also, and also we should mention the secret societies of the wandering and exiled Jewish minorities. Both of these groups, finding themselves in mostly unfriendly regions, united more and more among themselves in the effort to pre preserve and maintain their faiths. The secret meetings of Christians in the catacombs under Rome and other such organizations naturally led to the rise of religious societies where only persons trusted, tested and tried could be permitted to join the group. For a traitor might have resulted in the death of them all. Thus, the secret society that had originally initiated merely to improve society in general, now initiated to preserve itself, to maintain its own concepts, doctrines, or ideals, ideals in a hostile environment. From these routings, a number of other modifications gradually appeared. After the rise of Christendom, and it passed into a more or less positive relationship with society, the non-Christian minorities, who had once dominated, also found it expedient to organize against the rising power of Christendom. Thus we have a number of fringe organizations preserving their non-Christian identities for centuries after the rise of the church. They accomplished this by the use of the greatest secrecy and with due caution against the possibility of their true projects being discovered. 
most of the non-Christian secret societies did not, however, contemplate the overthrow of Christendom. They had no such grandiose idea. What they believed was that they possessed certain knowledge which was not commonly possessed by the members of the new faith, and they therefore united to protect and preserve this knowledge in order that it might not be extinguished. Thus these societies became protective of certain beliefs or certain attitudes or certain ideas, usually against what they regarded to be the in inadequacies of the generally regarded interpretations and procedures. Naturally these became the heretical sects and were gradually cast off into the darkness and into the wilderness many of them taking up their refuge in the Near East, particularly in the rising Arabian culture. Here also secret societies arose. And these societies give us another cross-section of our problem. Most religions and uh, abstract philosophical systems that have had broad spheres of influence found it expedient to divide within themselves, or division was more or less pressed upon them by their own members. If society has a majority of conformists who are perfectly content to follow in prevailing patterns, or to worship in an orthodox manner the dominant creeds and faiths of their times, there are always others, mystics, idealists, dreamers, scholars, scientists, philosophers, to whom the prevailing explanations are not sufficient. These persons inevitably seek for greater meaning. And as this meaning approaches the mystical or seeks to substitute internal revelation for tradition, these groups may come in conflict with the prevailing faith. To meet this conflict, they retire into a measure of secrecy. This secrecy serves several ends. First, it prevents outward division in a religion. It prevents a faith from being constantly in the presence of its own heretical followers. Furthermore, it advances to a degree and rather continuously the moral and ethical values of a faith and those ideals which a thousand years ago were regarded as totally esoteric have gradually come to be new standards of orthodoxy so that these mystical groups pressing on beyond the prevailing doctrines have become the pioneers of progress in nearly every uh, order of society with which they have been associated. This in brief perhaps summarizes the older situation. And it now comes to our mind to analyze the more recent trends in these uh, matters. The first sociological over-concept that develops from all of this is that the secret society represents an organization of the factor of mystery. Anything which is secret becomes a challenge. The moment we learn that there is something folks do not want us to know, we can never rest until we find out what it is. It is the same way with a personal secret. The individual possessing it is overshadowed by the sense of his own importance. The mere fact that he knows something not commonly known, gives him a membership in an exclusive aristocracy. He begins to show all the symptoms of this secret knowledge, and usually, um, unbound by obligation, rushes forth to share it. By so doing, gaining a peculiar distinction for being the person uh, from whom this secret knowledge is derived. 
Thus, there are many kinds of persons in the field of scholarship, for example. There are scholars who, making a discovery, will die rather than share it with anyone else. There are others who live only in the world of scholarship in order that they may share whatever they learn or discover. Human nature being widely diversified in its temperamental peculiarities, we do learn, however, that mystery exercises an influence far beyond its own proportions. The small child standing in the presence of a dark closet has certain inevitable reactions. This dark closet is powerful. It is almost overwhelming in its potential possibilities. A light is then turned on and there is nothing there. But this discovery of the nothingness of the dark closet solves nothing. The next time we are in presence of a dark closet, we go through the same experience again. We are never able to be certain, confident, or positive in our relation to the unknown. Secret societies, consequently, from the beginning, have exercised a strange and wonderful force upon tyrants. They have become, so to say, the reflectors of a man's conscience. The individual who is doing wrong, particularly the popular leader, or the autocrat, or the despot, fears desperately the possibility of the rise of private assembly within these areas. Uh, back in the days of World War I, most of the central powers immediately outlawed secret assembly for fear that it would result in the betrayal of their own purposes. In World War II, both Germany and Italy, under Hitler and Mussolini, outlawed secret societies for fear that from them would rise the force that would later judge them and would make more rapid their overthrow. Also, of course, in all countries now behind the Iron Curtain, secret societies are forbidden. For it is always possible that from them might come the counter-revolutions which are continuously feared. If a secret society does arise within a troubled state, and it is impossible for the police or agents of that state to ferret out the society and destroy it, it then becomes a ghost, haunting forever the tyrant and causing him to gain greater and greater fear and terror, looking with suspicion upon everyone, hardly daring to accept the closest ministrations of his own family for fear that they are in league against him. Thus the secret society as a political instrument enables a dozen men united together to appear with the strength of a million. That which is unknown multiplies its power. It is suspected of far more than it possesses, and it also becomes psychologically a judge and juror over the tyrant. It may never move, but its existence in his consciousness may well destroy him. The political power of such organizations, therefore, can, under certain conditions, be extraordinary, especially where the situations permit the continuance of secrecy. In what we call our modern way of life, secrecy, as known in antiquity and during the medieval period, such secrecy is no longer possible. Secrecy today is a highly relative term and nearly all secret societies are known. The motives for which they stand are known. Their memberships are known. 
that is, in those nations in which the general way of life does not cause leaders to fear such assembly, or does not give reason to assume that treason is intended, or the destruction of persons, property, or character is likely to follow. This means that in so-called highly advanced nations, uh, nations whose ways of life are comparatively adequate and whose citizens are reasonably contented, your secret societies function mostly as fraternal and benevolent orders, existing as the extensions of old ways, but not presenting any real or major threat to any existing integration of society. Modern societies, therefore, are inclined to advance special ideas, the advancement of which uh, will improve or adjust society, advance education, spiritualize against the prevailing materialism, and in many instances today, so-called secret societies are prime movers toward the recognition of religious value in a time when this seems to be something in strong and desperate need of defense. If, therefore, there is charitable work to be done, if there is need uh, for the strengthening of community ties, if the preservation of a level of consciousness is advanced by society activity, such societies will spring up, preserving part of the forms of older organizations, and perhaps even more of the spirit, but relating mostly to those classical societies which had as their principal aim the general improvement of man, or the protection of arts and sciences, or the service of the needy, or the extension of education towards a higher cultural platform, with emphasis upon the need of man to advance toward the future, better equipped than he is by ordinary methods now prevailing. From such considerations, societies may be regarded as benevolent. This is the way we generally think of them today. And in America today, there are many secret societies, mostly secret because of the membership's conviction that they have a project which would otherwise remain undone and to which they contribute by means of the slender framework based upon the older concept of assembly for particular purpose within a larger social theater. We think of this and we view the term secret society today as largely so meaning. But let us not forget that our way of life is not as yet the prevailing way of life for human beings. The civilization and culture of Western Europe and America has as yet not touched a comparatively large area of humankind. If, for instance, we may say that we have two and a half or two and three quarter billion human beings on earth today, it is also safe to say that better than half of that vast group does not live our way of life does not enjoy the temporal advantages which we enjoy, nor the personal security, nor the political representation, nor the religious tolerance. Therefore, it is certain that many motives which with us are no longer valid or are no longer sufficiently impressive to bring persons together in private assembly that such motives do exist in other areas, and that secret societies today, outside of our own sphere of influence, are very powerful and very continuing. 
and that these societies are for the most part similar in their purposes and objectives as those of Western Europe and America of 300, 400, or 500 years ago. In our way of life, we are not struggling for liberty. We are struggling, rather, for private freedom. In many countries, however, the struggle for civil liberty goes on against very desperate odds. Many countries are burdened with incredible internal confusion. There are new countries rising up today to attempt uh, their place in the sun with less than 1% literacy. The expansion of this type of activity as the only possible way of keeping tyranny from completely enslaving entire social groups. And at this time we know of several rather despotic leaders who are in constant and mortal fear and terror, surrounding themselves with the most exaggerated methods of personal defense because of their fear of private assembly within their own regions, and also their knowledge that this exists and their inability to ferret it out. One of the reasons they cannot discover these groups is because these groups are protected by the people in general. The people may not have the courage to belong to them or to advance secret causes against prevailing pressures, but they are sympathetic to these groups, therefore cannot be induced to reveal them and will usually simply decline to discuss it or insist that as far as they know, such assembly does not exist. It was private assembly which liberated Latin America not more than a hundred years ago. It was private assembly that resulted in the gradual rise of the rights of people throughout Europe 150, 200 years ago. It was private assembly that strongly advanced the cause of our own revolutionary war. It was private assembly that created the Republic of China in 1912. It was private assembly that advanced the freedom of most of the Far Eastern nations that finally achieved constitutional government. This secret assembly must therefore continue inasmuch as the need for it also continues. In our particular modern situation, we realize that there are large areas of the world today in which the ethical, spiritual, and moral needs of mankind are relatively ignored, where attitudes and processes are forced upon persons whose natures do not conform with such pressures. There has been a considerable enslaving of intellectuals. There has been a powerful trend against the rights of the individual to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we may say that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, these words, this statement, was once the secret statement of a secret society. This statement moved Europe nearly 200 years ago and brought about the tremendous change which was a powerful social advance for mankind. We know therefore that today behind barriers wherever tyranny exists there is a constant and desperate determination to resist. That these resistant movements arose in World War II in the form of the famous underground movements. These movements certainly were not religious primarily, although the concept of religion moved with them. They were not essentially philosophical. Yet they demanded obligations, 
and they tried and tested those who sought to join them. And these testings and trials were for the same purposes as ancient rites, namely to prove that the candidate could be entrusted with responsibility of knowledge, knowledge which, if misused, might destroy the other members of a fraternity. This type of thinking is going on strongly today. It is probably active in two-thirds of the world, and it is active toward ends which we here in America regard as highly desirable ends, ends leading to universal tolerance, universal education, universal opportunity, universal liberty. These are the essential principles of the modern secret society. Such societies also, of course, exist on purely specialized levels, as your educational societies, your Greek letter societies, and things of that nature. These are usually honor societies, toward which the individual aspires in order that he may prove his unusual proficiency or advancement in some subject. But even today, most of these honor societies in areas outside of our own are bound into the general picture. And this general picture has become considerably confused in the last 25 or 30 years. During most of the 19th century, secret societies that had brought peoples to various degrees of security have moved and created from themselves leaders, for most leadership was backed by some pressure. Had it not been so backed, it could not have moved forward against an entrenched tyranny. These leaders were individuals apparently, but had they not received help of some kind, usually secret help, they would not have been able to survive to achieve the reformations which they accomplished. But during the 19th century, most of this pressure let down. It looked as though the world was moving forward inevitably and magnificently toward a better state of things. It is true that there were wars, there were troubles in those days, but these troubles were comparatively uh, isolated. One arising here, one arising there. And most of these troublous situations were envisioned as means of accomplishing a further advancement of man by removing some obstacle to that advancement or by binding divided and discordant groups into some larger and more comprehensive pattern. The general trend, therefore, was for the secret society to move into fields essentially less vital than that of an earlier date. We find them, therefore, strongly advancing on the levels of trade unions and guilds. We find the rise of various movements intended to improve and protect various crafts and arts. We also find the rise of benevolent and fraternal orders, or the gradual transformation of earlier societies into these specializations. The Hung Society in China, for example, after it had achieved the democracy, <coughs> turned to labor situations and the internal protection and advancement of its underprivileged classes. There was a respite, <coughs> and individuals believed that the great work had been accomplished, that man would never again fall under the kind of tyranny from which it had emerged in the long and difficult period from the Dark Ages. In the last 25 years, the situation has been almost completely reversed. Today, tyranny looms large. The rights of man have been undermined in numerous areas. Most of all, materialism is rampant among groups 
on the ground that it is only by the extinction of ideals that slavery can be perpetuated. Materialism leads inevitably toward the acceptance of slavery. It removes from the individual his vision of greater spiritual value and in this way takes away from him his basic impulse to defend and protect such value at all cost. <clears throat> so we have today a world which perhaps is not much better off in total than it was 500 years ago. It knows more, it is richer, and in some areas, such as the Western Hemisphere, its progress continues at a reasonable rate. But for the rest of the world, life is closing in, and has closed in for a number of years. It has reduced its boundaries to medieval fortresses. It has divided its proje projects and purposes, and under the general name and term of me mechanistic progress, it has lost sight of most of the values that are real and dear to the private citizen. The family is attacked. The home is attacked. The right of private um, assembly is attacked. The privilege of free vote is attacked. The right to worship. Uh, to have convictions is either attacked or ridiculed. And by degrees, uh, the private citizen is reduced to the state in which the need for private assembly is strongly re-emphasized. As a result of this condition, such private assembly is rising throughout these areas. Private assembly, in some instances, for private worship. And there are countries today where worship is not very different from the way it was in the catacombs under Rome during the time of the pagan Caesars. It is necessary to meet secretly in cellar and attic and to watch constantly for a traitor in your midst. It is hard for us to imagine that such things can exist today. But there are actually secret societies that have been created in certain parts of Eastern Europe for one purpose only, the circulation among the members of a Western newspaper. Something which could and might very likely cause the most terrible penalty if any one of that little circle should betray the others. It is a little hard for us to imagine all this, but it is true. Now your secret society, moving into a situation, moves in with a tremendous traditional background. All through Eastern Europe, secret societies existed from before the beginning of the Christian era. These secret societies had long and illustrious histories of fighting for the right of these peoples to exist, to overcome the restrictions and limitations of arbitrary aristocracies. These secret societies struggled for freedom from serfdom, the establishment of citizenship, the right to possess property, the right to educate children, uh, the right to pray, uh, the right to read and write. These things were fought for with every ounce of courage that human beings possessed. There were numerous martyrs toward these ends, and some very hideous and horrible things happened beyond almost the imagination of modern man. He cannot see how anyone could so persecute another for such reasonable and commendable objectives. These societies were and still are known to the peoples of these countries. They are part of the tradition of these peoples, uh, like the famous Bogomils of the Balkans, 
and other groups, constantly struggling until they attained a measure of achievement and made possible the glimpse of a better way of life. Then came an opening of Europe. Opportunity, travel, brought visitors, education increased, schools sprang up everywhere. Freedom of culture began to be enjoyed. In some cases, comparatively moderate, but at the same time, far in excess of that which previously existed. Then all of a sudden, with two great world wars, this progress was stopped in its tracks. Things began to go back to the medieval, to the incredibly limited and restricted. And the natural tendency of all these peoples was to fall back upon tradition, upon the traditional struggle of their great and venerated heroes to achieve these ends which men knew were right. Thus societies that had either been extinct for several hundred years were brought back to life, or those which had changed their purposes to more benevolent or fraternal ends were rededicated to their original projects. And out of the general situation has risen a network of secret societies. These, many of them, with strong political purposes because there seems to be no other way of breaking through the tyranny that now oppresses them. Most of these societies are created out of groups of so-called ordinary citizens. Sometimes from such a group will arise, as has occurred in the past, a brilliant leader. But because these societies are built from the people and not from the so-called oligarchy or leading group, these societies are for the most part not only uh, patriotic but religious. They represent, again, the demand for spiritual consolation and strength and the right to preserve and protect worship, and to bring their children into direct contact with valuable ideals. These parents have observed the detrimental effect of the prevailing policies upon the young, how their children are losing the ideals and principles which are the basis of good citizenship in a free world. They therefore desire to restore this right of citizenship and to privately instruct their children against the common pressure of public instruction. Thus, in almost every bracket of life, the public way is antagonistic to the private conviction of the citizen. He meets this by strengthening his own position, and in union there is strength. Therefore, he unites with others of his kind in a protective alliance re-establishing the ancient ceremonies of initiation in order to protect himself against the possibility of treason. It is impossible to say at the present time how many persons are actually involved in such societies. We see the different types appearing in a fleeting manner in our own country. And there is scarcely a male that comes into the office which doesn't have some kind of advertising or publicity, even here, relating to organizations rising up or continuing for various purposes, either benevolent or not benevolent. Sometimes the society is a distinctly unpleasant entity one which is uh, created simply to preserve bigotry or to protect tyranny of some kind. On the whole, however, particularly where the need is great, the society is benevolent. It is only in a secure civilization that societies can afford to bicker and can afford to establish unhealthy programs. 
In your oppressed areas, there is neither inclination nor time for such extravagances. Out of all of this thinking, then comes the archetypal fact resting in ourselves of the importance of the individual maintaining certain individuality even where a civilization is comparatively adequate. I think that the great struggle of the secret society today follows the secret impulse of man himself, and that is the impulse to be oneself against what appears to be a majority pressure. Today, the person struggling to keep his values finds that for many reasons these values are continually being undermined. Here in the West, the preservation of value is possible inasmuch as we have freedom of assembly and freedom of worship. But some way, as in other times, we are not convinced that all of the advantages that we have are best suited to our needs or that we are making the best possible use of our various advantages. There are many devout persons who are not entirely satisfied with the theological opportunities offered by community worship. There are many deep and profound scholars who are not satisfied with the present pattern of our educational system. These and other dissatisfactions lead persons to various endeavors. They lead educators of a liberal mind to create new schools in order to bring this education to the people. They invite the formation of new religious groups to emphasize what is regarded as neglected spirituality. There is also uh, the continuance of your political and your labor organization for various purposes, some of which are due and proper, some of which are oppressive and excessive. But these things arising in a free assembly ultimately solve themselves. But in other areas, they will not solve themselves because such opportunities are not given. Each person finds in the course of his years uh, the tremendous pressures which are against his ability to do those things which he regards as essentially right and proper. For instance, today we have a great many persons who strongly resent, as individuals, the business practices imposed upon them in the course of their employment. They are expected to do things and to make compromises with their own principles, which they resent. And as a result of collective wrong policies, the individual is under heavy psychological pressure and tension. There is therefore in this alone a simple answer to a need. The individual's so unhappy so resentful, will probably ultimately organize. They will force their opinion upon the world by uniting among themselves. And this is your essential pattern for the rise of societies. In a free society of men, these societies wave their flags, have public assembly, and receive broad publicity. In a tyrannical situation, such societies must go underground, must hide themselves and seek to gather numerical or political strength in order that they may ultimately overwhelm the tyranny that opposes them. This concept uh, does remain as an important consideration. There is one other point which I think we should also bear in mind as we analyze societies of this nature. Namely, the belief that was held and is held in many parts of the world 
that behind and beyond all of this confusion that we know, there is an archetypal social pattern. And a good example of this would be found by the contemplation of Eastern and Near Eastern religious philosophy. Among both your uh, Far Asiatics and your Near Asiatics, there is a common belief that above and beyond the ordinary uh, governments, the ordinary leaderships, and the more traditional secret societies, there are in the world certain groups that have functioned and existed in complete secrecy over vast periods of time. That these secret societies have not ceased, but continue to exercise a powerful directive upon humanity. This in turn strikes a deep and responsive root in the psychological life of the individual. It is only another way by which he says there is a purpose. There is a plan. There is a broad wall of protection around the activities of mortals whereby they cannot destroy themselves or injure themselves beyond the possibility of reasonable remedy. Psychologically, this concept has always existed. Factually, it is to be found in many places. It is not easy for us to accept such an idea, perhaps, but if you are on the caravan trail out of Samarkand or some place of that nature, and you sit down with the native peoples, with the men of the desert, who live in their own strange distant region, facing the immediate problems of life as we do not have to face them anymore. And you hear what they say, and you think with them. You suddenly perceive, as it were, a world of overtones, real to these people. And after you have discussed with them, these overtones become strangely real to you because you have been moved out of the simple security of your own way of life into another pattern. I think we may safely say that half of the people of the earth today believe that be, be, between God as a supreme principle and man as the projection of that principle into society, that between these there are intermediaries that there are always in the world certain God-enlightened prophets, certain great teachers, wise ones, as mentioned in the scriptures of every people, including the Christian scriptures, that this world is not suspended in a void, that we are not left without certain resources, and that if we wish to regard these resources as arising from an archetypal government within ourselves, then psychologically there is at the root of us a tremendous archetypal fraternity, a fraternity of purposes by which individuals are bound together at their sources, even though they are widely diversified and divided in their developments and in the uh, periphery of their existences. The existence of this overkind of government is man's way of symbolically stating that he believes in law, that he believes in order, that all the divine principles operating in nature are substantially invisible in themselves and visible only in their consequences. Yet these invisible principles are continuously conspiring, and conspiring with evidence of rational directive,
toward the improvement of man and the protection of those values which man has come to regard as indispensable. It is only a step, therefore, to consider a kind of hierarchy, a kind of overgroup, bound together by true knowledge, bound together by a common possession of realities, that this group forms some kind of a formal or informal structure, a structure which man most rapidly apperceives by retiring into his own nature and, preserve, and perceiving at the root of himself cosmos and structure rather than chaos and disorder. That uh, most religions have from the beginning taught the realities of such prophets, such patriarchs, and have indicated that behind the general government of man there is an invisible government of principles. These principles administered by beings of some nature or kind, and that these beings form together the sacred and supreme government of the world. In Asia this is commonly believed. In the Near East it is held as a certainty. <coughs> and many Western peoples have become profoundly sympathetic to such an idea. Your psychologist will take the attitude that this is merely an escape from personal responsibility. That every individual is looking for parents. Every one of us is looking for strength upon which to lean. We all wish to believe in some protection, some protective force, and we are unwilling to look upon community protection as sufficient. We are not willing to look upon our physical, political government as solutional for the reason that in our serious contemplation we are unable to justify that the leadership which we immediately recognize is adequate for our ultimate needs. Under these thoughts and conditions, we naturally turn, as man has from the beginning, in the direction of faith. Faith being in reality, our conviction of the reality of certain substance which we do not see, and yet without which life is meaningless. We look into ourselves, we cannot see our own life, yet by this life we live, and from it is suspended all that we do. We cannot see our thought, yet by this thought we become reasonable beings. We cannot see the light that nourishes things, but we behold them to be nourished. Thus we cannot entirely overcome the belief that there resides in invisibles, principles, powers, energies, and for that matter, rationalisms, which are not apparent immediately in themselves, but the reality of which we must accept in order to preserve our own integrities and rededicate ourselves to those ends which we know to be right. Ancient secret societies worshipped secretly the secret God. They worshipped a concept of a divine power moving continuously into life for the improvement of man. Modern human beings are not quite so convinced of this. Yet in many parts of the world, they have retained the old beliefs and strengthened them and rationalized them, and no amount of culture or westernization has been able to take it from them. Namely, that there is a tremendous preserving force administered intelligently by beings or persons who are party to the ultimate secrets of the divine purpose that there are those as called God-illumined persons. And this illumination includes the conviction that there is a pattern and that the laws, principles, and motions of society are governed from a root. And in contemplating this root, man has come to the inevitable conclusion that it is a godly formation 
a godly grouping of beings. Such belief is of the mind of Islam. It is of the mind of India. It is of the mind of China. It is the mind of Japan. It is the mind of North Africa. For wherever these peoples go, uh, the belief that there are among them certain saintly beings has never been questioned or doubted. Even among our Western Indians today, the belief in this over-government flourishes in the little desert pueblos. It flourishes also among the various religious sects of the area, both Indian and non-Indian. Everywhere there is the belief of, a, of an invisible intercession, a power moving in upon man, and it has been normal to assume that this power is composed of an organization, a government over governments, an archetypal government such as Plato expressed in his doctrine of the philosophic elect, that this being conceivable to man means that it is, that it exists, for man cannot imagine or devise out of himself that which is inconsistent with the universal framework in which he functions. So many nations look to this over government with the greatest hope that it will ultimately lead to their liberation, such as the mind of China today, such as the mind of India. For beneath and behind all other allegiances is the allegiance to the great gods that dwell beyond the snowy band of Himavat. These gods are not merely deities alone walking the earth. They are the great gurus, the teachers of teachers, and from them spreads out the great religious educational system of Asia. And this educational system is grounded firmly in the belief in an, uh, in an invisible hierarchy of illumined beings to whom uh, men can aspire and attain and serve if they pass through the necessary trials and testings as in the ancient religious systems. This subject, of course, is highly controversial. But regardless of controversy, let us face it. Uh, there are many controversial things that we never question. We never question in our common religious thinking. Uh, for example, the forgiveness of sin. Yet this can be a very highly controversial issue. Many millions of people never question the vicarious atonement although rationally it is impossible to demonstrate. Yet at the same time, they will question another concept that is foreign or strange to them, but no less reasonable. These concepts, therefore, will always be questioned by those to whom the need is not immediate. But to the four or five hundred million Chinese who are seeking desperately at the present time to preserve themselves as a people, against a comparative minority of materialistically trained autocrats, the belief in an infinite justice, infinitely manifesting, and available to them from their ancient religion, their ancient faiths, and personified for them in their sages and teachers. Such beliefs are essential to survival, to the maintenance of a conviction, and this conviction will operate because out of the believing will come the strength to support that belief when practical evidence arises. In the Near East and in North Africa the same situation prevails. The, the advent of the promised saint, the coming Messiah, is awaited throughout the Islamic world. The coming of another teacher is their great need. They believe firmly that this teacher will arise from the depths of the great secret assembly which they hold to be sacred. They believe definitely that it will rise out of the spirit and soul of Islam, locked in its mysterious hierarchy of sanctified but invisible teachers. 
They therefore wait patiently for the coming of their Ahmed, their beloved of all nations. They wait for the coming of the being in whom these attributes will appear. When he comes, Islam rises with him because Islam is already conditioned for him. Everywhere, therefore, where men have traditions, they have traditions of these visible or invisible organizations. And wherever need arises, they revitalize them and use them as instruments against tyranny. Also in our private lives, we personally have a belief in a secret organization. We have a belief in the secret laws of God operating visibly in the world, but substantially held in the divine mind, held as something held secret and sacred. And it is because we believe in these laws and believe in their ultimate manifestation to all men that we variously serve and endeavor and carry on the numerous activities of life with a good hope against the perils of the times. Because we have a belief that there is a divine authority behind all human authority and that this authority operates in the world according to the will of the divine through instruments selected for that purpose. Because of this, we are able to meet the future with serenity of spirit, whereas those not so believing live in continuously increasing tension and doubt. Thus the ideas that there are positive and constructive forces continuously operating beneath the surface of society, such ideas help us to continue our own lives in a more constructive and benevolent manner giving us the continuous assurance that we are laboring in the causes that are right and that, that this right will ultimately succeed and will come to the full expression of itself. This is more or less the psychology behind the great religious and philosophical societies of the past. And this is the psychology which moving from religion has made political and social progress possible. Therefore, we have a continuing indebtedness to such societies until those times come in which their various noble incentives and purposes are so completely fulfilled that their need no longer remains. And this cannot be until the world is indeed one brotherhood of enlightened persons working together for common good preserving each other's rights and privileges as inalienable and dedicated to common security and world peace. When these things happen, then we will see, as the ancient said, the mysterious temple of the mysteries, born and fashioned in this world, and that our entire way of life will be a sanctuary of divine powers. This was their ancient dream and it survives to guide, instruct, and inspire us in our modern way of life. Time's up.